It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by Spotify Greenroom. Have you ever listened to a podcast like this one and you wanted to bring up your own point or just chat with other people that are listening at the same time? Well, let me tell you about Spotify Greenroom. This is the first social audio platform made just for sports fans. The app is free to download, and once you're in, you can talk with us, other fans, athletes, insiders in real time about your favorite sport or team. Download the app, currently available on iOS devices, Create a profile, link your Twitter, join one of the groups for the latest league updates, and then you'll see us there. Spotify Greenroom, changing the way we talk sports. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Locked on Winnipeg Jets podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, and I'm a Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, if you enjoyed this episode and want to stay tuned to the latest and greatest in Winnipeg Jets news and analysis, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, and the Odyssey app. Doing so does not cost you a single cent and ensures you never miss another episode. This show is brought to you by Spotify Greenroom. Download the Spotify Greenroom app and find one of our lockdown rooms. On tonight's episode, there are a number of interesting topics. Obviously, later this evening, we have the NHL entry draft, which for the Jets should be interesting with, I believe, the 16th or 17th overall pick. Quite a few decent prospects. Maybe Winnipeg looks at a puck mover like um, Carson Lambos, or if Cole Sillinger is there for a forward, maybe they look for some scoring and, and certainly um, a, a bit more punch up front, because right now the Jets' goal scoring ability is a little bit more limited than we'd like. Before we break that down, though, I wanted to talk about some of the crazy stuff that is currently unfolding in the NHL trade market, because we have a couple of major trades, and then I'll talk about what the Jets could do in this trade market in order to improve, because it seems like everyone is is really interested in making a lot of roster upgrades, while Winnipeg itself has been very quiet. Um, let's first talk about one of the trades that happened yesterday, and that was Shane Gostas Bear to the Arizona Coyotes... But that wasn't it. Included with Shane Gostas Bear was a 2022 7th round pick and a 2022 second round pick. And if you're wondering what the Flyers got in return, absolutely nothing. Now you might say, well they had to get something right, and that something is cap space, which of course is very important for a team like the Flyers. They just traded for Ryan Ellis, they wanted to clear off some salary. Obviously I, I get it from a certain perspective, but treating Gostas Bear like a cap dump for me is probably a mistake. I think Shane actually has decent offensive value, especially if you use him on the power play or in sheltered 5v5 minutes. I think if you give him the right role, especially one where he's allowed to be offensively aggressive on the puck, his cap hit a 4.5 million for the next two years will actually look like a very good deal. Again, I don't think he's some like elite blue liner, but if you're looking for an offensive jump on your back end with somebody who has genuine offensive skill, puck handling ability, a really solid shot, and good vision, I think you could do a lot worse than Gostas Bear. And what's even crazier is they got paid to take on his contract. Shane is obviously not what he once was a couple of seasons ago, but what he is right now is a very solid second pairing guy, and I feel like a lot of teams could have used him, especially taking on a few extra draft picks, a second rounder included. In another salary move, we also saw the Carolina Hurricanes trade um, goalie Alex Nedeljkovic to the Red Wings in exchange for, I believe it was a third round pick, and Jonathan Bernier. Now, Bernier is an expiring asset. He will be looking for a contract extension, and by all accounts, Nedeljkovic was looking for around three by three and a half million or so. But the actual offer that Carolina gave him was one and a half million for an undisclosed amount of time. I've seen a lot of people who said that Carolina very much lost this trade, and I agree in part. I think the return itself wasn't very good, but I understand in terms of not wanting to put a lot of money into Nadalkovich, I, I get that. I think what's kind of odd here is that Alex, in a lot of ways, is an unproven commodity. He did have a runner-up for a, a Calder nomination, but beyond that, his NHL track record is pretty short, and his AHL track record is a little bit mediocre. So, at the pro level, I can understand why the Canes might not be willing to give him a ton of money, but I'm also a little bit curious because Bernier will be looking for around the same amount of money. I don't think Bernier is all that great at this stage of his career. He's definitely on the wrong side of 30. He's been around the block a few times, and at this stage, he's more suited to like a backup role. So if you're looking at a choice between Nedeljkovic and Bernier, I don't understand why you wouldn't really consider giving Nedeljkovic a similar deal and looking to bridge him to see if he's the real thing. You know, the worst that happens is you get two seasons of a goalie who is maybe average or below average, and then you move on. 
But the best case scenario is Nadalkovich's success is actually sustainable. Again, goalies are kind of a weird one, so I do understand it to a point, but I also kind of have to question what the, the reasoning behind this was. I'm not really sure if Carolina made the right choice here, but it is kind of funny that Steve Eiserman was trying to essentially dunk on the, uh, the Hurricanes for trading them away. He was asked why they made this deal, and he said, you'll have to ask them, I don't know. But Eiserman also willingly traded assets for Nick Letty, so it's not like this guy is completely foolproof. That said, going from Bernier to Nadelkovic for a third round pick is actually not bad. I feel like that could be a decent investment if things pan out. I don't know that Nadelkovic will actually thrive in Detroit because, let's be honest, their blue line is kind of a mess. That team is a bit of a, a work in progress, we'll, we'll call it, but Nadelkovic is on the younger side. I think he's around his mid-20s or so, which is pretty decent prime age for a young goalie. Maybe they see something in him that others don't. I'm not 100% convinced myself that he's going to be the kind of goalie who's going to thrive in a team that is, by all accounts, in complete rebuild mode. But, you know, as a talent that you could potentially build around on the back end, you know, you, you don't really hate the risk of, of throwing away a third round pick and moving one of your expiring assets to find out if he's the real deal. I think from Carolina's perspective, I'm just surprised that they were willing to move him for such a low return and really weren't interested in trying to bridge him at a reasonable price. One and a half million is definitely undercutting it, and I don't think that was the best offer. In fact, I'm sure Nadelkovich's camp probably felt like it was a bit insulting, but when it comes to the Canes, I generally think they have a pretty good understanding of where they are and what their cap situation is. Maybe their internal modeling and stuff suggested that paying him a decent amount of money over the next couple of seasons would hamstring them in some sort of negotiation later. I don't really know. But after some of the recent moves, like the Shea trade, I didn't really think was great. And this this move, I'm not 100% sure I, I agree with. I don't know. Maybe Carolina isn't as, as amazing as we thought it was. Maybe there are some moments in the front office where there's a little bit of a disconnect somewhere. Every hockey organization is going to run a little bit differently, and I'm sure there's plenty of dissenting opinions inside a front office, but the past couple of moves from them, I, I don't 100% agree with. And they still have to decide what to do with Dougie Hamilton, so Carolina has a lot of stuff on the board, and maybe moving um, off this goalie thing where he was looking at $3.5 million, for them at least they felt they needed that cap space for Dougie or something, who knows. We'll, we'll get a better sense of things as the season starts to roll in and more and more information leaks. But, you know, those were the most minor deals. The stuff that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment is pretty mind-blowing. It's, it's so mind-blowing that I can't believe we actually saw these trades go through. I have to imagine that if they were in a fantasy hockey league, somebody would be hitting the veto button. We'll be back in just a moment with some discussions about those trades and why the Jets may have dodged a huge bullet. Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. According to studies, less than 13% of all inventors who hold a U.S. patent are women. Black and Hispanic college graduates patent at half the rate of their white counterparts. But we can fix that by increasing participation in innovation and patenting by underrepresented groups. It would quadruple the number of American inventors and increase annual GDP by almost $1 trillion. Invent Together is a coalition of organizations, companies, universities, and concerned citizens committed to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to invent and patent. Because the more diverse the American patent system gets, the stronger and more successful our nation will become. What can you do to help diverse inventors patent and unleash economic opportunity? Find out at inventtogether.org. Learn more and take action today. This episode is brought to you by HP+. Plus. In a world full of smart devices, shouldn't your printer be smart too? It is with HP+. Plus. These printers know when they're running low, so you always get the ink you need delivered right when you need it. Plus, you save up to 50% on ink, so you can print whatever you want, as much as you want, any time you want. Huh, that is pretty smart. Get six free months of instant ink when you choose HP+. Plus. Conditions apply. Visit hp.com slash smart for details. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Locked On Winnipeg Jets podcast. We are now discussing major trades and stuff that maybe the Jets should be in on or, or stuff that they might have dodged. And uh, one of the trades that just occurred that I'm a little bit disappointed the Jets didn't try to at least get a, a foot into is the St. Louis Blues getting Pavel Buchnevich in exchange for a second-round pick and Sammy Blay. 
Booch is actually a fantastic and creative top six winger. I feel like Booch has been a, a great performer for the Rangers for some time now, and it became clear that he was something of a cap casualty. But with the recent moves the Rangers have made, like signing Barclay Goudreau for like, you know, six years at, what, three and a half million or so per season, I'm very puzzled by the direction that they're going. I feel like this move in particular was kind of unnecessary. If you're going to start moving salary, you need to make sure that you don't commit to salary that you don't need. And I, I get it. Goudreau is actually an improvement for their bottom six, which their, their third and fourth lines have suffered for some time, but you're not really supposed to pay a lot of money to depth players. There are guys like Tyler Ennis who hit the market every season, and all of these guys can perform at a level and do more than Goudreau does. I like Barkley. I think he actually serves a very valuable role, but there's a reason Tampa Bay didn't resign him. It's because you don't really want to commit a lot of money to depth players who only have a couple of limited functions. If you start paying $3.5 million to really good, like, four checkers and stuff, but guys who don't really do much else, you're in a little bit of trouble long term. The one thing I will say about the Jets not really getting in on the Buchnevich trade is that there's a very good chance he might not have come to the Jets, especially if he's an expiring asset. He's currently in an arbitration stage, so I feel like the Jets... It's fair if Winnipeg felt like he wasn't going to re-sign, but I would rather know that they at least tried and had a conversation about it. You know, do your due diligence on a player that could easily upgrade Winnipeg's top six. I, I know that the Jets are thought to have a really deep forward unit, but I don't think it's anywhere near as deep as the perception is, so... Winnipeg, I felt like this was a little bit of a miss if Buchnevich would have any intention of signing here. But for all that, that's not great about that. Winnipeg did get a massive relief in not trading for Rasmus Ristolainen. Ristolainen ended up fetching a huge return of a first-round pick, 13th overall, and Robert Haig from the, uh, the Philadelphia Flyers. There may have been like another pick somewhere in that package, but 13th overall and Haig was, um, I think, considered the main return on this one. And that for me is just baffling. Uh, Ristolainen, for one thing, is expiring. He's only got like a season or so left on his contract. And Ristolainen's also just bad. Like as far as like big defenders are concerned, he does have a big shot. He can be useful on the power play and he does have some offensive instincts. But beyond that, his actual on ice impact is very limited. If anything, you're going to be conceding a lot more chances with him on the ice, and you won't be getting many offensive zone possessions with him, so I feel like if you're looking at a contract that is like $5.5 million, is set to end soon, and is for a player that really wouldn't scratch most top fours on actually great contenders, I don't understand why you would trade 13th overall for him. Robert Haig is probably around the same kind of player that Ristolainen is, a lot more physical and less shooty, but certainly another depth defender that I feel like his on-ice performance doesn't really differ enough to to justify anywhere that kind of cost for Ristolainen. Everything that the Flyers just did basically undid all of their good work to bring in Ryan Ellis. They got Ellis, then they jettisoned Gostas Bear, and then they bring in Ristolainen. I don't really get that from any sort of perspective. I don't think that that actually makes any sense. If you're looking to improve your defense, you just kind of gutted it instead. Gostas Bear is easily much better than Ristolainen is, and he, you know, was basically given away along with draft picks, which I, I, for the life of me, I don't really understand. Maybe there's some unknown issue that the public isn't privy to yet, but either way, it's just a bad look. And this then brings us to the Jets, because Winnipeg was one of the teams rumored to be interested in Ristolainen. Once again, somebody else being really stupid kind of saved the Jets, but I feel like time and time again we're basically hoping that teams bail Winnipeg out, which is not something that I would rely on. If Winnipeg was willing to give a high first round pick or a mid rounder, I just I'd be baffled by that, and I don't really feel like he actually fits the way the Jets play. Maybe Shovel Day off or somebody in the organization really loves his big shot right handed D stuff, but I'd honestly rather have Bolu on the first pairing again if that's the choice, because it's basically the same thing as bringing in Ristolainen at a much higher cap hit. Winnipeg also has to figure out how to get Neil Pionk under contract, so it's not like bringing in Ristolainen really makes that any easier. There are some interesting trade names out there that I feel like the Jets should be in on, um, and a couple of free agents. I've mentioned some of the free agents in previous episodes, but Jake McCabe is still an option. I would be very interested in bringing McCabe in for a second pairing role. I feel like his two-way transition game and his more defensive aspects would make him a really good fit, especially for a team that frankly needs a stabilizing blue liner. On the trade market, we also still have Brock Besser and uh, Troy Stetcher, as well as Nate Schmidt, all of whom could be on the block. Stetcher, I think, is, is probably staying in Detroit. He seems like he's okay there, but in terms of Schmidt and Besser, both of those guys probably need a change of scenery. 
Schmidt in particular wants out, but I think with him I do kind of wonder about his contract situation. He's on the wrong side of 30 at this stage of his career, and while he's not exactly old or anything, I just don't know about bringing in a big contract with a lot of term. I want to say he's signed somewhere around 2025 or till 2026, which, that's a pretty hefty commitment. Now, the thing you're getting with uh, Schmidt is a really good top four left-handed puck-moving defender, so Nate would actually be a huge offensive boost, he's great at even strength, he's very good on the power play, he'd basically be in all situations D for the Jets, and somebody that would be, uh, in, in my opinion, at least a, a needle mover for this team. He's certainly one of the more well-rounded options and somebody that, as as a person who lives near D.C., I got to watch a lot of when he was with the Caps. I was a big fan of Schmidt, and I know that his time in Vancouver hasn't exactly gone to plan, but he's the kind of player that I think the Jets would love. I, you know, they, they obviously dodged a bullet with Ristolainen, but if Nate Schmidt basically has to be given away, maybe the Jets could work out a deal to get at least some of the salary retained and bring in Schmidt on a really good price. Again, you know, the, the term of his contract is a little bit sketchy, but... I feel like it's workable to a degree. And then there's Brock Besser. Besser, for me, would be a very clear offensive upgrade for the top six in terms of shooting talent. And he's also like a break-even player in terms of shot impacts on the ice. He actually has some defensive ability in terms of tracking back and man marking, and uh, it actually reflects when you look at his underlying numbers in terms of scoring chances against. Besser is more or less a pretty neutral player, but what he does drive is shooting percentages. He's a legit gifted goal scorer and somebody that the Jets could absolutely use because right now the Jets have too many players who are shooters um, and actually don't have any sort of defensive impact. Besser, as a break even player, immediately improves the team. He also gives the Jets a little bit more uh, power play depth and certainly even strength scoring prowess. So I feel like there's a, a couple of alignments here. If the Jets were to move Andrew Kopp over to the Canucks and maybe like Logan Stanley and something else, you bring in Schmidt and Besser on, on potential contracts, um, especially Besser for an extension and, and Schmidt's money that could be potentially retained with like, I don't know, 20% salary or something somewhere along the line. I feel like the Jets could actually win a trade. I don't know that this is a move that they are interested in, but if they are, I would highly recommend that they seek it out sooner rather than later and get ahead of the arms race because the Central Division looks like it's going to be pretty tough next season and the Jets cannot afford to sit still. Let me know what you would do in this offseason at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter. For now, though, we're going to turn our attention to the NHL entry draft in just a moment, diving into who the Jets have selected and what this prospect may bring to Winnipeg long term. Before then, though, I wanted to tell you a little bit about why Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market. Are you someone who loves protein bars? Are you tired of all of your favorite protein bars tasting like ash and dirt? Maybe you're ready for a change. And as a fellow protein bar appreciator, I can tell you that Built Bar is your best alternative. It's the only protein bar that tastes more like a candy bar, with a 100% chocolate exterior and a soft, chewy interior. It comes in several delicious flavors like salted caramel, orange, cookies and cream, German chocolate, and so many other great flavors. Built Bar often releases very special, limited edition, limited quantity flavors that once they're gone, they're gone for good, so stay tuned to their social media platforms and their website to make sure you never miss another flavor. As delicious as Built Bars are, they're even better for you, with most bars clocking in at around 130 to 180 calories, 4 to 5 grams of net carbs, and 70 to 18 grams of protein. Built Bars are perfect for every lifestyle, whether you're looking to maintain or lose weight. Placing your order couldn't be easier. Go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your next order. Again, that is promo code LOCKED15 at checkout for 15% off at Built.com. Place your order today for the best tasting protein bar on the market. Every day can bring changes, challenges, and opportunities that can also change your personal or business financial goals and priorities. As a true partner, Sandy Spring Bank can make it all a bit easier. Someone who really listens, understands, and then creates solutions in hard times and good times. We'll always strive to be your advocate today and every day. That's real banking for real life and real business. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash real. Member FDIC. Welcome back to this episode of the Locked on Winnipeg Jets podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We are uh, covering the Jets NHL draft in the first round. They have finally made their pick. It took um, a couple of hours for us to actually get through this process because the NHL decided to drag out this draft as long as humanly possible. With the 18th pick in this NHL draft, which I believe was technically number 17 after the forfeiture of, what was it, Arizona's pick at number 11? I can't keep track. 
Either way, though, the Jets got uh, Chaz Lucius, which is a very interesting pick. I think a couple of people, myself included, weren't super aware of him. I had known his name before previously and that people were pretty high on his offensive skill sets. Um, so, of course, once he was drafted, I took a look at some of the reports, uh, took a look at some of the, the highlight footage, which doesn't really give you a full picture of his game. But just from some early observations, a couple of things stood out. And I think one of the biggest things is that he's a very smart goal scorer. This kid loves to get into really high danger areas, and he does so by sort of playing off defenders, drifting into spots around the, the slot area, occasionally, you know, falling below the goal line and then rebounding to curl himself back into position. He loves getting into these really dangerous areas behind defenders where they're not really looking. And oftentimes he seems to recognize when there's a good goal scoring opportunity, either from a puck that's about to be turned over by one of his teammates or from a passing route that he sees before it develops. And I really feel like that positional awareness, the situational awareness, and his elite positioning makes him a genuine goal-scoring threat. And that's before you even get to his physicals. He's a pretty sizable center. I wouldn't say he's super, super tall. He's kind of like an average height for an NHLer, but it always seems like compared to the rest of the kids that he was playing with, he's a big dude. He seems to have upper body strength for days because his release is extremely hard and it's very fast. Oftentimes, the puck just sort of explodes off his stick. And he's often been compared to Kyle Connor because he has elite stick handling and one-on-one -on -one matchup skills to pair with his release. I feel like where where um, Connor is a little bit more of a direct player who often uses like straight line speed and a lot of acceleration to break past defenders, you know, Lucius is more of a positional player who sort of glides around in the offensive zone and waits for plays to develop as he sets them up. He's been described as a shoot-first player who has a lot of vision and finesse to pull off really great passes, which I personally like. That's sort of what Line was like when he was here. He had, of course, that amazing release and shot, but oftentimes he would pull off this really sick assist that a lot of people maybe thought he wasn't capable of. Um, but in terms of like his edge work, I didn't see him really exploding on breakaways or anything. Oftentimes, he just has a really good mobility, lots of lateral motion, and pretty strong edge work that allows him to keep a good sense of balance. So while he might not have like the world's fastest top gear right now, I feel like he's plenty mobile enough and he'll be an offensive threat no matter where you want him. He's currently playing as a center, but it seems like a lot of people are projecting him to move out to the wing for at least a little bit before maybe returning to center. One thing that stuck out to me when I was reading Scott Wheeler's article from The Athletic about his story of becoming an NHL prospect, it stuck out to me how a lot of his quotes and the descriptions from his coaches made him sound like Mark Shifley when Shifley was in his prime a couple of seasons ago. It reminds me a lot of that in terms of the, the commitment to work ethic, the whole hockey nerd stuff, and just the general vibe that I got from his descriptions of of his desire to improve, the constant study and evaluation of his own skill sets and ability, and uh, a relentless drive, because Lucius has had injuries before. One of them was very recent and sidelined him for most of last year. But his coaches said he didn't, you know, mope around and wait for something to happen. He took charge of what he could manage and essentially try to get himself back on track. And I feel like that, that sort of mindset's very important. Somebody who wants to be constantly improving, looking to take that next step and, and really advance in his career. And I feel like he is a very good character fit. There's a lot to like with his profile so far. I, I want to do a little bit more digging into him. I know that there were some criticisms of like his defense, but I also saw some folks praise him for being very smart about when to force turnovers and stuff. And from what I saw from some of his highlights, he actually does seem a lot more engaged than somebody like Kyle Connor is. Connor's often kind of cheating in the neutral zone or towards his own blue line rather than participating in dropping below the faceoff circles, but Lucius actually seems to be a pretty good puck pursuer. And after having seen his really high-end positional awareness inside the offensive zone, it wouldn't shock me if he's actually capable of getting into some decent defensive positions to shut down passing and shooting lanes and using those skill sets tries to make defensive plays out of that. I could see that being decently successful. If he's, you know, maybe like a break-even player with amazing passing and a ridiculous shot, I feel like the Jets are going to be absolutely thrilled. He was chosen in the middle of the first round, and that is basically a home run pick. A lot of people seem to love it. Um, I think it's a great one from what I've seen and from what I can tell from the scouting reports and all that. And it sounds like he does have the potential to be like a top 5, top 10 talent from this draft. So let's hope that Chaz has a really good start to his career as a Winnipeg player over the next couple of years. I'm excited to see him. Let me know what you thought of the draft pick at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter. For tonight's episode, though, that will do it. Before you log off, don't forget to check out one of our other great podcasts, Locked on Bets. Betting on the NHL doesn't have to be a guessing game if you listen to the new Locked on Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Get daily picks, blowout specials, wrong team favorite picks, and Lee Sterling's lock of the day. Follow the Locked on Bets podcast brought to you by betonline.ag wherever you get your favorite media. And as always, thanks for listening, have a great night, and go Jets go!
This episode is brought to you by Spotify Greenroom. Have you ever listened to a podcast like this one and you wanted to bring up your own point or just chat with other people that are listening at the same time? Well, let me tell you about Spotify Greenroom. This is the first social audio platform made just for sports fans. The app is free to download, and once you're in, you can talk with us, other fans, athletes, insiders in real time about your favorite sport or team. Download the app, currently available on iOS devices, Create a profile, link your Twitter, join one of the groups for the latest league updates, and then you'll see us there. Spotify Greenroom, changing the way we talk sports.